good afternoon and thank you for joining ADA on this International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction to launch and showcase Australia's inaugural Systemic Disaster Risk Handbook. My name is Amanda Leck and I'm the Executive Director at the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience and I'm delighted to be your host today. I wish to start by acknowledging that I am hosting this event from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you will join us from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters across Australia. Before we go to our speakers for today's webinar, I would like to introduce Senator the Honourable Bridget McKenzie, Minister for Emergency Management and the National Recovery and Resilience Agency, who will officially launch the Systemic Disaster Risk Handbook. Today I want to talk about preparing our communities for the impacts of natural disasters and other major challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic. Nobody likes to think disasters will happen to them, but across the country we're exposed to a range of natural hazards, such as cyclones, floods, storms, drought, bushfires and even earthquakes. On this International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, we take a moment to reflect on the crucial need for us to identify and reduce disaster risks to the community. The Productivity Commission estimates that 97% of all disaster funding is spent on recovery and cleanup, while just 3% is spent on mitigation, preparedness and resilience. The Australian Government is committed to shifting that balance. Reducing our vulnerability and exposure to hazards is key to increasing our resilience. We need to do both. Continuing our response to disasters, our recovery from them, and applying the lessons learned to reduce the risks and impacts for future hazards. On the 5th of May this year, the Australian Government established the National Recovery and Resilience Agency, one of the key recommendations of the Bushfire Royal Commission to provide national leadership and strategic coordination for disaster resilience and recovery risk reduction and preparedness. This means that for the first time, we have an enduring national agency focused on helping communities be better prepared for natural disasters and to recover from hazards. The government is also investing in other practical mitigation initiatives. In May, we announced the $600 million Preparing Australia program designed to improve the resilience of Australian communities. The government is also investing $130.5 million in a joint disaster risk reduction package with our states and territories. With a combined investment of $261 million, this work is targeted at reducing the risk and impact of natural disasters on Australian communities. While hazards like fires, cyclones and floods are inevitable, by working together we can lessen the impacts. And to help achieve this, the Australian Government is partnering with groups like the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience to look at practical ways to build our knowledge base and become a more risk aware nation. Today, as part of the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Institute is launching the Systemic Disaster Risk Handbook, which provides us with the opportunities for improved learning, development and innovation in the way we manage disasters. It also provides us with greater knowledge and resources to help us make informed decisions. And it's integral to Australia's guidance on national disaster risk reduction and resilience. The handbook has been developed through a rigorous process of national consultation with experts and key stakeholders from across the disaster risk reduction and resilience landscape. So thank you to all who've contributed. The work of the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience and others in the community to reduce our vulnerability contributes to further strengthening resilience and the achievement of sustainable development. We've all got a role to play in this. Your participation ensures that we can develop a vision for the future and make decisions about longer term recovery activities that are suited to individuals and communities. There is a generational opportunity to address many of the challenges we now face as a nation. I look forward to working with you to make our communities stronger and even better prepared. 
Thank you, Minister Mackenzie. This handbook has been developed with funding support to ADA from the Commonwealth Government through the National Recovery and Resilience Agency. I would now like to provide you with some brief housekeeping notes. Today's event will be recorded and made available after the event. Today we will be using the Q&A feature on Zoom to take questions, so please post your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat window. You will be able to upvote questions by clicking the thumbs up button and I will do my best to answer a number of those uh, questions to the speakers following their presentations. I encourage you to use the chat window to share any thoughts or reflections during the presentations and just a reminder that you will need to select all panellists and attendees in the drop down menu for everyone attending to view your messages. I would also like to remind you to please be respectful of each other and our presenters when posting your comments. Australia's inaugural systemic disaster risk handbook is now live and freely available to download from Ada's Knowledge Hub. As we have heard from Minister Mackenzie, the handbook supports the implementation of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and the United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. It is an integral component of Australia's National Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience Guidance. The handbook works from the premise that we are in a new era of disaster risk management. The pace of change is extraordinary. The great risk amplifier of climate change is driving creation of new hazards and disaster risk. And the age of taking a hazard by hazard risk reduction approach is over. In these circumstances, we must encourage, support and resource experimenting with new ideas and concepts. The handbook presents a series of foundational concepts and principles for systemic disaster risk reduction, inclusive governance and decision making to support resilience and sustainability. In doing so, it fosters a disaster risk mindset to guide the evolution of good practice and innovative thought leadership to turn actions into outcomes. The diagram you can see on the screen here has been developed in consultation with the Australian government. It shows how the handbook collection aligns to the disaster risk reduction and resilience policy landscape from the international context with the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction to the national context with the national disaster risk reduction framework and the national strategy for disaster resilience. It also maps the 17 handbooks currently in the collection to the emergency management spectrum, that is prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. You will note the systemic disaster risk and Australian emergency management arrangements handbooks sit at the centre of the continuum as they are the capstone handbooks with high level guidance relevant to the entire collection. This is an important development as it demonstrates the important role handbooks play in establishing the standard for good practice in disaster risk reduction and resilience and guiding the implementation of government policy. Today, we are joined by four speakers who will unpack the principle-based guidance in the handbook and provide tangible examples to demonstrate how the principles can be applied in practice. Please join me in welcoming our speakers for today. Gillian Edwards from Beyond Business as Usual, who was the handbook writer, Beck Dawson from Resilient Sydney, Professor Alan March from the University of Melbourne and Ramana James from IAG. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Gillian Edwards, Director of Beyond Business as Usual. Gillian is a specialist in helping solve complex problems and a thought leader in systemic climate and disaster risk management, emergency management, capability building and community services. She was a member of the Australian Government's National Resilience Task Force, where she was a co-creator of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and Strategic Guidance Materials, and was the driving force behind the project to profile Australia's vulnerability. Thank you very much, Amanda, and um, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this um, showcase event today and launching the Systemic Disaster Risk Handbook. 
Um, I'm joining you to today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in the beautiful Yarra Valley um, in Victoria, Australia. We have um, a limited time to uh, introduce to you a very complex piece of work, but I'm going to do my best to hit the highlights and help you um, as an introductory level into understand what this handbook is all about and why it came to be. I'm going to start first with um, a quote that you may have often heard um, from all sorts of sources, um, and it, fun it is fundamental to this particular handbook that today's context requires a different mindset than when the problems were created in the first place. And uh, that sticks in my mind, that quote, and I know it was very relevant um, to the group who worked on this particular handbook. And um, I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are on what that mindset might be. Keep that in mind as we progress through this particular piece of work. Um, the handbook itself is very high level and is principles led, uh, deliberately so because it is all about trying to foster uh, a disaster risk mindset that guides all of us through the evolution of all of our practices and our business models and our thought leadership to turn actions into outcomes. Greg, would you mind advancing the slides? Before I really take you through the highlights and what it's all about, there must be some acknowledgements to the behind the scenes with this particular handbook. Um, it was evident throughout its production that we, the people who worked on it and informed it and uh, provided support and guidance to it, there was a common purpose and it was very evident about the passion and commitment that was brought to this piece of work uh, to do what we can and to start to really um, put greater efforts into reducing harm and loss. The handbook itself um, must be acknowledged by all those who have and continue to contribute a very rich body of knowledge and their experiences over decades. And uh, this, to the best that we could do in, in, with the handbook is referenced throughout. We, um, we have made good use of this wonderful, rich knowledge and experience to try and inform this piece of work. The members of the working group themselves, I must acknowledge the contribution um, around about 30 people from very diverse sectors um, contributed to this piece and some um, more deeply than others, given their time available to do so, but they're all, their contributions were gratefully received and it was very much a co-design and co-production piece. The Ada project team, Caitlin Sampson and Ella Wilkinson could, could not have done this without your help and support. Cheryl Durand, who helped me with some of the early analysis and writing of the handbook. And I'm going to acknowledge all of you and all those who follow us from this first edition of the disaster, a Systemic Disaster Risk Handbook. You'll be leaders and pioneers of systemic change. And um, I have great hope for the future. Next slide, please. So here's what you can expect. Um, you can expect the very best efforts of all of those people that I mentioned before, and you can expect a very deliberate focus on people and the mindset that goes into the evolution of good decision making in a very complex and uncertain world. There is something for everybody in there, um, and the challenge with the whole handbook was to find a good balance of being able to hit the highlights and the most important aspects to think about, given it is the first edition. It is filled with practical examples of its principles to help bring them to life for you. And I'm joined today by a wonderful pa panel of colleagues who will help you do that through their examples and, and their presentation shortly. And you should know that it is unfinished business. And uh, one of the principles is adaptive learning. And uh, this is a, a prime example of it. It's the first edition and there's much more that we as a collective will be able to do to advance its principles and help with its purpose. So um, recognising that there will be um, tensions between current uh, methods and um, processes and arrangements, um, we need to recognise that we need to get in front of that. So there's a lot of unfinished business about building this um, evolution of our guidance in this space. Thank you, next slide. Just tell me what I need to know is a, an, a common question and point raised by a lot of people who are 
really feeling quite overwhelmed by the amount of change that's occurring, the amount of information and guidance and opinions and um, information that needs to be processed. So this handbook goes to the heart of that too, is to trying to help to tell you what you need to know, um, to help sort of really get in front of this change and embracing uncertainty and the complexity. The... Um, as part of Tell Me What It Is You Need to Know is a fundamental premise of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. Uh, a lot of efforts occurring um, at the international and national level to recognise that um, there are natural hazards, but the disasters, disasters themselves are not necessarily natural. So this is an evolution of our thinking and our mindset to extend beyond just thinking about the hazard itself and into the causes and effects and interrelationships between our systems that cause disasters. Momentum is building, and um, this is very much, I'm sure you're feeling it very acutely as well, that there's often call for national leadership, co cohesion and coordination. Momentum is building. So how do we help provide some guidance so that we can do this together? As a, and have collective impact. This is what's at the heart of the handbook itself as well. Um, recognition that NARAG, so in Australia, we have the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines, and um, it has served this country extremely well for around about 10 to 15 years, and it has matured our level of thinking about the characteristics of natural hazards and the consequences that they can, that can befall our societies. So this is recognising this handbook um, has uh, served us very well, but there is now a new generation that needs to be developed. And on what basis would you develop the next iteration of NERAC? Um, and the, creating this particular handbook and approaching it through a mindset helps provide that sort of guidance on, on the next iterations of various methods to do so. Next slide, please. So ha having regard for that, the, uh, another premise that underpinned the development of the handbook was a sense of recognition also of the urgency to act. And uh, I mentioned earlier about the momentum that was building. So how do you get in front of that? How do you actually start to provide that guidance and, and facilitate some cohesion, as I mentioned? So deliberately, the working group and under the guidance of Ada, we, we decided to go big and go bold. So what is it that we could actually do to try and get ahead of that? And um, with the diagram on the left-hand side there, you can see the, um, in the inner circles, the dynamics between the international standard for risk management, which um, has all sorts of other associated and complementary guidance to its implementation. I mentioned NERAG, so in Australia, the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines. Um, those two, pieces of work are very complementary to each other. On the um, outer circle, you can see with the dotted area, there is an e a body of work and a considerable amount of evolving methods, guidance, and indeed um, initiatives and institutions that are being developed to advance systemic disaster risk. Um, and I will touch on uh, one of them um, separately in a moment, and that's about resilience and adaptation investment. So where would the handbook sit? Where would we position this? So if um, you could just hit the button. It's sitting in the middle and it's sitting right in the centre of it because it is about trying to provide that guidance and have a ripple effect to inform what comes next. Um, it is a good chance, as I said before, about providing that sense of cohesion and coordination and bring all, our, all of our efforts together in, a, in that sort of way. Why did we decide to go big, go bold, and hit the concept of shifting mindsets and changing systems? Why? Because the research tells us that it can have the most profound effect. Risk begins and ends with people, as we've so often seen as well. And in fact, there's a book about it with from Lisa Sisson. And if we can influence a change to mindsets and um, uh, guide behaviours, then we can have a profound impact. Next slide, please. I'm going to run out of time. I apologise in advance. The next few slides are really about just hitting the actual concepts that underpinned it. And, um, you know, principles led is about seeing beyond the rules and laws and really starting to look at those behaviours, 
values and actions that we can all take to make a difference. And we'll again see many more examples of that shortly. Next slide. So the context, uh, changing the risk context is important. And Amanda mentioned earlier about we're in this new era of advanced disaster risk um, reduction. We need to evolve beyond the current paradigm and thinking around uh, disaster emergency risk management and start to inject and include systemic risk and resilience. And we will talk more about that shortly as well through our examples. Next slide. Building inclusive governance and risk cultures. And um, again, fundamental here is about removing the barriers that enable the whole of society involvement. Uh, is vital to resilience and reducing loss and, um, and taking the harm out of the system. We need to be able to do this together. And that inclusive governance is key to this. Next slide. And in doing this, and all of these various principles fit together, by the way, they're all interrelated. Um, but in, again, we need to rethink the methods that we use. And there are a whole lot more people that need to be able to um, have the ability, the knowledge and the um, engagement in reducing disaster risk and be able to thrive in response to the shocks and stresses that we know are going to continue to affect our communities going forward. So we need to rethink what we mean by that. And um, here I mentioned before about one of those um, areas of adapting um, and um, and really taking to the next level what we need to do about reducing systemic risk. And this is a piece of work, an extract from a piece of work around, from the um, CSIRO and value advisory partners that um, have been working on one of the priority areas of the disaster risk reduction framework, and it's enabling resilient investment. And it was just such a good slide to help us um, with that contextualizing going beyond current disaster and emergency management arrangements and um, the importance of establishing um, the independence and coordination of all of the efforts that are going into this space. Important point here is about the increasing uncertainty and scale and magnitude of change. So there is a web link there to um, be able to dive deeper into that piece of work. It, it is very um, innovative and, um, and novel and new and an important piece um, of the puzzle in this space. Next slide, please. What now? I think one of the challenges for us um, is that uh, comment from the Australian Government Royal Commission into National Disaster Arrangements. And um, that point there is about, it was difficult for them to determine the extent to which the principles that exist in a whole range of spaces have in fact actually resulted in tangible outcomes. The challenge for all of us is to actually use this work to do that. We're all learning, there's signposts and links throughout the handbook. We need to connect and collaborate and we really need to work together now to start to create addition two um, in, a, in a, a, period a period of time from here on in. So I'm sorry I have to rush that end of uh, that last part, but um, thank you very much. I'm so pleased that it is now live and available and um, everyone can actually start to access it and use it. And it was a privilege to be involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. And um, I think when people download it and get a chance to read it, they will see the enormous amount of work you've put into it. So on behalf of the entire Ada, Ada team, thank you for your taking on the role of, of writing this handbook for us. To complement the handbook, Ada has developed a series of case study profiles with leaders and decision makers from across the disaster risk reduction and resilience landscape. These case studies provide real life examples and insights into the decision making challenges of today's risk context, embracing active learning opportunities and paying forward the knowledge and expertise gained over many years. These case studies demonstrate how the handbook principles can be applied in practice. I would like to share some of the highlights from the case study series with you now. I'm sure many of the comments you hear will resonate with you all. The thing about climate change is that we all know that there is a body of science that's telling us this is all going to get worse and it's going to exaggerate the problems that we've got today. And so suddenly you've got to flip your thinking to pro being proactive as opposed to reactive and foreshadowing something that may happen, but there is still a possibility it may not happen. 
One of the things I think the skill set of a good planner is that we're able to crystallize a plethora of information and land it at a decision, whatever that may be. When we understand cascading or clustered risks between different sectors, between people and businesses and governments, then we can make much better decisions about what matters. We have more data than ever before. We've got amazing tools such as artificial intelligence that helps us interpret that data with greater insights. We can make better decisions. Core to resilience planning is understanding local capacity and capability. It needs to place a great emphasis on community engagement and we need to better understand the diversity, the needs, strengths and vulnerabilities that exist within those communities. Risk assessment and management is not like a, cooking a chocolate cake or something where you just you know, read a set of instructions, throw in the ingredients, put it in the oven and out comes a risk assessment. It's a lot more involved um, and ambiguous than that. If we're not engaging widely with the population of an urban centre, for example, not understanding how different organisations at government and business perceive those risks and also contribute to them, then we will not understand where those issues lie across the city. We have to work together and network to understand the risks. With good building construction codes and making sure that we incentivise and encourage mitigation, the impacts of these things can be far less. The role of leadership is to ensure that we capture the energy that comes out of that in our community to get them to shift their thinking to a better place. We are the influencers and I think um, if we take on board our responsibility in that regard, it'll be all the better for our communities going forward. Our second speaker for today is Beck Dawson, Chief Resilience Officer with Resilience Sydney. Beck is known as the person paid to worry for Sydney. Beck's role is connected to the global Resilient Cities Network, and she is a champion of place-based systems thinking and using deep community engagement to inform public policy and citywide action. Over to you, Beck. Hi everyone, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Great to see the handbook finally launched. Um, it's so exciting to have this resource now across Australia. So congratulations to Ada and all the participants and many of them um, that I certainly met along the way. It's um, really fantastic piece of work. So I'm just gonna give you a quick example of what does this staff actually mean in practice? You know, how do we see that on the ground? How do you use it? What does it tell you that you didn't have before today? So this is just a quick snapshot of a program that's been running for five years in metropolitan Sydney, which is obviously in New South Wales. And that program has been working through local government to understand disaster risk across a whole metropolitan area. So my job is to try and get 5 million people to end up in a safer, more connected, more resilient city because of the way we've understood these systemic risks in the place where they live and all the systems that they use every day in that place. So in terms of a, using this kind of approach, it is a place-based systems risk approach. It tries to explain or understand how all these things are knitted together or particularly where they are not, that helps us explain, well, what do we need to focus on? What do we prioritise? Which connections do we build? And which things do we invest in? So next slide, thanks. And the first thing we did was use an international framework that looked at a kind of citywide risk or city resilience framework that takes a system risk approach. And what you'll notice is this was the top list of eight shocks that we got out of that risk assessment. This was in 2016. Lots of people told me I was really crazy to have the one at the top right at the time because it was just never going to happen. We haven't had one for 100 years. How on earth could that be in the list of the top eight shocks for Sydney? And I think nobody asks me that question anymore. The reason we were able to understand that is because the mathematics of system risk shows you the scale of impact that happens when systems go wrong or when systems are stopped or when the connections between them break. And so a disease pandemic is a good example of a risk that impacts every single member of a population of a place and when you look at it in place, it also stops the economy. You end up with a health 
shock that turns into an economic shock that turns into a social shock. And those shock events can be understood, named and numericized in taking a system risk approach when you think about the consequences that layer down not just from individual assets or organizations, but through a whole community. And so the practical example of this is that you can see there's a whole range of different types of shock events that get named in those sorts, that sort of assessment. That normally, if you just took a narrow view or you just look at a single hazard, the, a number of these things just won't pop up. Um, you can see just for context, extreme weather for Sydney is still the biggest set of shock events. So the top ones are heat, storms and flooding and bushfires. And heat is something that people wouldn't necessarily have put at the top of the list, but it impacts again, the whole of the Sydney population every year. It has big impacts on things like infrastructure systems, transport, um, but also social and health systems too. So again, taking that lens of what are all the pieces that this thing's gonna impact and thinking through them is a way of really understanding what do we need to change in place to make our place safer. Next slide, thanks. And so here's just an example of how we've done that here, simplified into three steps. What happened in the past and what's the local context in that place? How do we understand both the short-term shocks and the long-term slow burning issues of the place that make it vulnerable to those systemic issues? You talk about what might happen. So what's the growth and what's the trajectory that might happen over here? What kind of investment um, approach have we got and what policies are in place already? But most importantly, number three, you absolutely, and this is really clear through the document, you have to engage widely, ask the population of that place, the people who run the businesses of that place, what do they prioritise and what do they need changed? So resilience for whom is a really important question when you're starting to talk about place-based risk. And it helps uh, in the context of like literally just today, I've been chatting with Osgrid in Sydney about understanding how do we manage heat, put trees in the ground, reduce bushfire risk from wires, all of those things together are things we need to work on collectively across the city, all connected together in one big investment strategy that sits in their business. So they don't have the rules and the shape yet about how they make those priorities that will work best for the community. But by working together between different actors in a place, we can start to talk about what do we invest in first to change to get bigger, wider resilience benefits. Next slide, thanks. And then, you know, just broadly, what does it look like? Here's the five steps that I think about. You know, identify those stresses, understand the shocks, think about the context of how those impacts will happen over time. In a, for example, if your place is growing or changing, what kind of businesses are going to be working there? So I talk about resilience hazards being an output of a systemic risk assessment. So it gives you, a, rather than just a natural hazard, you're kind of talking about the things that will actually create impact. And how do we understand and test those with the community so the community has context on them? And then we can make changes and develop projects. Just go to the next slide. In Sydney, I just want to make the point, this is the group of people that stood on the town hall steps in 2018 to launch our strategy. They had never previously convened together to talk about the really big issues that our community faces across the whole city together. But when we talk about risk in place and we understand all the things that are common or the issues that are gonna be common to all of us in that place, it also allows us to convene together and understand that we must work together to change it. So we'd never previously had a network of networks. My program has intervened as a governance solution because Sydney's problem was categorically not connected too many layers, lots of silos, not any structures to help us work together. Our intervention puts network of network of networks from the mayor, mayors and CEOs of businesses and state government agencies all the way down to people working on the ground in community organisations in place to understand what can they start to do to help manage some of these risks across the city. So when a pandemic happened, it took us two days to convene the whole city to come together. We already had the networks in place because we'd done this work in advance. We understood the risk. Everyone could come together. We could actually sit down and share a pandemic subplan for every place in the city. Within a few weeks, everyone had one. 
we're coordinated, we can identify the issues we need to fix to adapt really quickly. Within a month, the whole city was already pivoting to make the changes that we needed for a smoother transition to manage and respond to that major event. It's a good example of how you can take this idea and actually literally deliver it in practice. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Beck. And um, great work that Resilient Sydney is doing uh, across a broad range of sectors. So very well done. Our third speaker for today is Professor Alan March from the University of Melbourne. Alan is Professor of Urban Planning. His research examines practical governance mechanisms in planning and urban design and the role of urban planning in reducing disaster risks. Alan led the BNHCRC project Integrating Urban Planning and Disaster Risk Reduction and was Ada's lead writer for Land Use Planning for Disaster Resilient Communities Handbook. Over to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Amanda. And uh, congratulations, everyone, of course, Jill uh, and the whole team. This is a significant achievement. Uh, I, I do kind of feel like this is one of those moments in time where some, some sort of significant change is really gathering pace, just to echo some of the previous comments, including from Jill herself. Uh, I, I wanna take, uh, as invited, a, a particular view of, of the handbook. Obviously, I saw it on the way through, uh, and then looking at it again more recently, just before its release, uh, I was asked to sort of react to it and take a position, essentially from the land use planning, viewpoint which I'll provide. So next slide please. Uh, uh, urban planning, of course, we think that we're the really important profession, uh, but of course we are just one of, of many, many actors uh, in any system, of course. But what we try and do is, is to, to organise decisions and to bring about improvements and benefits that wouldn't otherwise come about. How do we arrange places and people in advantageous ways and avoid problems into the future. But of course, we are just one actor and uh, we're part of these ongoing large dynamic systems that are small and large uh, and, and that uh, are very challenging often to understand. The, the real thing <laughs> that I wanna communicate on this slide, however, is uh, urban planning uh, as a planner, one quickly works out that we don't really have that much power. We have a bit, but the only way we can really be effective, including to do with disaster risk reduction, is to work with others really, really effectively. It's the joined up system approach that really makes an impact. Next slide, please. Uh, the other comment I would make is, is this, this challenge of wicked problems problems that don't have easy, easy linear solutions. Uh, we're not entirely certain sometimes of the causes or whether um, a, a particular action will bring about exactly the desired effect. Uh, and recent research I did, uh, and I've taken here in this slide, a fairly traditional view of hazards, but doing that quite deliberately to recognise and make the comment that in our research, we've continually found that even disparate hazards, many of the drivers, many of the challenges behind why these risks exist or are being uh, dealt with effectively is joined up and interrelated in particular places and in particular systems. Next slide, please. So, so to, to sort of bring this down uh, to, to a practical solution, uh, as I was reading the handbook in its last iteration, I was struck by a reaction uh, I had to the last sort of larger piece of research I did on heatwave uh, for Resilience New South Wales, uh, for the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC, looking into heatwave and building codes and to some extent land use planning. And I was struck by uh, how necessary many of the principles in the, the handbook, the systemic disaster handbook about shifting mindsets and systems how relevant they were to many of the findings uh, of us looking into heatwave. Next slide, please. And so uh, I thought I found it very interesting to just contrast on the right hand side of the slide you've got there, our findings in, in a very summarised form, 
uh, which is essentially a deficit sort of mindset. You know, this is what's not working right now. And I found that uh, very quickly uh, by looking at one slide, uh, one particular image of a very complex but also simple and clear handbook, these guiding principles, how going through those against the problems we identified uh, to do with heat wave uh, really became very apparent that the handbook took me uh, to a path of actually actively trying to seek solutions and positive outcomes. I really like uh, the central uh, horizontal band through this practical change, cutting across different tiers of governance. I would also sort of add to that in my mind, I took that to mean in places at different regional scales and putting people very central to this to echo the comments of other speakers today. And uh, some things, and I'll, I'll kind of finish on this note. Uh, I have one more slide, but I'll, I'll finish on this note to make a few comments to these guiding principles using the example of heatwave. What really jumped out at me to deal with a risk like uh, heatwave, integrated action and shared responsibilities are absolutely central to this. Uh, imagine also that heatwaves are often associated with bushfire events, smoke, um, drought, power failure or, or power brownouts, um, health systems or emergency uh, services being overwhelmed. Uh, and so we can't, uh, to echo the, the other comments again, we can't just look at heatwave on its own necessarily. But when we start trying to really work out, well, how would we deal with these um, challenges associated with heatwave and related events, the solutions are multi-sectoral straight away. We need building codes that integrate with planning systems. We need to get the commercial sector in, say for, uh, for example, uh, to, to use um, shopping centres or government buildings to provide places of refuge. Uh, we need to try and find multi-benefits from better design uh, because we find very quickly that buildings that handle sustained heat better are inevitably more energy efficient, uh, or hopefully they are as well. And a lot of this is, it really comes back to this continual improvement model. How can we find ways as we develop and we retrofit places over time, how can we do this? Uh, a lot of it does need to be data driven. Uh, Heatwave plays out in very different ways in different places. We need to identify the people uh, who are at risk as well and to identify the kinds of services we can provide to them. And, uh, and it needs leadership. We need to cut through a lot of these problems and break uh, some of the cultural habits we have to just work on our sector. So there's much more I could say about Heatwave, of course, but just to choose one image I found very inspiring from the handbook that spoke directly to some of the findings I had in the Heatwave project that took me forward to perhaps some of the solutions. So last slide, just as one last comment there. Um, I really like this diagram as well, shifting mindsets. It's absolutely central. And then we need to drill down to practical solutions, but to not just say that we have wicked problems alone, there are emerging, I believe, elegant solutions, ways to really move forward and work together on these things. So thanks again, and uh, so so excellent to, to be here on such a, an important release. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks very much, Alan, and thanks again for your contribution to the handbook as well. Our fourth speaker today is Ramana Jain, Executive General Manager of Safer Communities at IAG. Ramana leads IAG's Safer Communities and Shared Value Activity, which focuses on executing IAG's purpose of making your world a safer place and supporting commercial opportunities through this work. Ramana has been recognised as a shared value trailblazer and recently co-chaired the Coordinating Working Group for the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative. Over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I thought I would give a, I guess, a corporate or business perspective um, in the context of the handbook and addressing systemic disaster risk. Um, IAG is a general insurer, so we have brands like NRMA Insurance, CGU, WFI, so we insure assets and the things that people own, and those things are particularly impacted by disaster risk. 
we also have a purpose to make your world a safer place, which drives us to think about not only the risk transfer that is insurance and the important role that insurance plays in the disaster risk management system, helping people get back on their feet and recover, but it also helps us think through how do we play a role at the front end of the system and thinking about preparation, reduction and management of that risk as well. But what I would thought I'd focus on from the handbook is principle 1.4, which is about establishing long-term sustainability goals. And so that principle refers to the need to um, look outwards and think about what are the organising frameworks, um, the different guidance that happens both globally, then at a national level, regionally and locally, that we can connect into as risk professionals and thinking about and managing systemic disaster risk. So for us, uh, thinking about IAG and the brands that we run in general insurance, um, I think about the sustainable development goals. And in the SDGs, number 13 is around climate action. And target 13.1 is very focused on how we strengthen resilience and the adaptive capacity to climate related hazards. And then you also have the Sendai framework. And the Sendai framework, the fourth sort of focus and priority within that is around building and enhancing disaster preparedness. So using those frameworks as an organisation, they enable us to then think about what are those longer term goals that we have as an organisation that ladder into those global frameworks. And we've got a commitment to increasing the number of our customers that take preparedness action or that improve their disaster risk and manage that. That's obviously good for individuals, communities and society generally, but it's actually really good for our organisation as well. So what does that drive us to do setting out a longer term goal like that within our own organisation is that it drives us to think about what's our relationship to other organisations and to other players within the system of disaster risk. And so that leads us to think about how do we partner at the sort of national level and state level through governments? How do we work with the Resilience and Recovery Agency and the state agencies around improving the overall approach, the policy settings that help actually guide and manage disaster risk? But then it helps us think about, well, how do we partner effectively? It could be with other businesses and corporations like we've done with the Australian Business Roundtable and the Australian Red Cross as part of that. So community organisations as well to help address that systemic risk. It also makes us think about what is the unique knowledge and capability that we bring that we can add into the system of management. So our knowledge of claims and historical but current claims, but also our unique ability to research climate and climate risk at geographic areas based on different types of perils. And we can bring that to the table in helping think about and address the risk at that systemic level. So just I'll wrap it up because I know we want to get to some Q&A. So just I think as an individual organisation within the overall system, making sure we look up at those global sort of national, regional, local frameworks that we are a part of that help address that systemic risk is really important to then set ourselves goals within those that enable us to then connect and partner across the system as well. Thanks very much, Amanda. And thank you, Romana. And thanks again for your guidance in the development of the handbook as well. It's really been appreciated. We've got about 10 minutes now, so we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Some of my colleagues have already answered some uh, live in the live environment if uh, listeners would like to have a look at those. But I'll go to uh, the question with the most upvotes at the moment. Given the focus is on systemic risk, in what way does the handbook speak to family violence, gender and homelessness, especially for those living in rural and remote areas impacted by disaster? So I think many of you have touched on this theme about systemic risk and the impacts for people on place. So I might actually go to Beck first with that question. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. It's a good question because all of those issues you've just raised are good examples of systemic risks um, coming from a whole range of systems issues across uh, our society and you know, often in place, but also the networks of the place that you come from too. Um, there's a lot of discussion in local government circles, certainly about, um, but also state government who ha often have a lot of responsibility for implementing changes in these kind of systems. So my experience in Sydney is that there's 
there's a range of really interesting programs starting to use system risk logic and um, the kind of approaches that are being talked about in this book in those kinds of challenges. I don't think the document speaks directly to those at the moment, but they would be the sorts of things that come out. So family violence came out really strongly in the re resilience assessment that we did as one of the really key underlying vulnerabilities across the metropolitan area. It's not in our top eight, but it's certainly in the top 20 of the, the really big issues. And I would say over the last five years, it's probably gone further up that list and it would be closer to the list that we see now. So it should come up is the short answer in these sorts of assessments. It should be really clear in the place where you are. And I'm sure it would be sadly very common across the whole of Australia. Thanks very much Beck. I might just keep going and get through as many questions as we can. Uh, drought is often excluded from disaster management considerations but it's a really classic example of a slow onset disaster with significant social, environmental and economic impacts if poorly managed. Uh, given the shift described today, is drought going to be more integrated in disaster management planning? Um, Romana, you've probably got quite a bit of experience where you are with drought. Would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, look, I, I can't at that sort of broader policy setting level, but in terms of as an organisation that interacts with and engages with customers regularly who are impacted by even these slow onset um, events like drought, clearly the flow on effect from that into other perils, and this is where we go back to the system based piece is that you're going drought over long periods of time leads to increased bushfire risk, which leads to more direct and immediate natural peril or disaster impacts as well. And so for someone like us as a general insurer, understanding the flow of drought and its impact over time on rural and regional customers, our farmers, and how we can support and enable them, but also then how that flows through to uh, more of those shorter term shocks that can occur on the back of the drought, like bushfire and you know, the terrible uh, experiences that we had over the last couple of years, which flows through to significant impacts on um, you know, individual homes that are burnt and impacted as well. So um, for us, uh, understanding not just the one-off major events, but those other systemic events that are perhaps more slow moving and longer term are critical to understanding how the system works. Thanks, Ramana. Uh, there's a broad question here. There's a couple of questions around, you know, the role of local government. We know that local government is the layer of government closest to communities. Um, and asking what engagement has been considered with local government and developers to build, you know, appropriate buildings, you know, appropriate locations, those kinds of things. Um, we know local government, and there are many local government representatives online today, are key users of the ADA handbooks. Uh, Jill, I know local government were involved in the working group and steering committee. Would you like to take that question? Thanks, Amanda. Um, and thanks for the question. And um, I might need a minute to ponder on that. Um, yeah, we... Uh, the Tasmania were a very front and centre with being, um, supporting the development of this handbook and we're on the working group and we're actively involved. And... It coincided with um, the state actually doing a revisit of their uh, disaster risk management plans. And um, it, as a part of that process, they were demonstrating and particularly modelling a lot of the principles that are in the handbook as well. And that a key component of that was this concept and, and one of the key concepts underpinning it is about inclusive governance. And um, that sort of goes to all levels of government and uh, institutions being able to extend um, the opportunity to be part of the decision making to all players in the whole ecosystem. So um, the local government representatives that were participating in this um, offered some significant insights into the issues and challenges that they have. Um, and of course, we've, we've got some um, interviews uh, posted up online that can help people understand the challenge of uh, making really good decisions, well risk informed decisions for local communities, using an, an inclusive governance model and making sure that the right people are at the table to inform those conversations and more importantly, those decisions. So um, I think that was a, a, a message that came through loud and clear and um, watching some of the other comments that are coming through, the various, and as Beck and others have already spoken about, the various um, areas of society and um, inclusiveness of, of everyone, 
all Australians to be part of the decision making into the future rests on us being able to get better at that inclusive governance and that really well informed and inclusive decision making. Thanks, Jill. I think that's a nice segue into a question around leadership. So um, I'll go to you, Alan, given uh, the complex example you provided around Heatwave. Can you speak to the role of leadership and embracing uncertainty when making decisions in these increasingly complex times? Yeah, well, gee, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think leadership is really important. We do need to we do need to join the dots. I do remember so many years ago, um, I think I was at Emergency Management Australia doing one of the, the control room um, training exercises. And one of the things they drilled into us is um, work out how much time you got, use the time, and then actually make a decision and do something. Don't, don't just sit around in case you're not sure what to do. Be, you've got to decide. And <laughs> I, I often think of that because uh, uh, finding things that will help, finding the areas where uh, gains can be made uh, is, is so much better than, than doing nothing. But there's, there's also uh, this, this idea of integration. And I think leaders can, to sort of follow some of the themes that have come up already, Integration is a big thing for me because leaders can look across, and I'm sort of riffing off the other comments just now, leaders have the ability to look across, find shared objectives and try and maintain that goals are being um, achieved in concordance in various ways. And uh, so, so kind of making decisions rather than just hanging around and trying to find those those areas of concordance and organisation where shared benefits can be found. And increasingly in my work, I find things like sustainability equals um, energy efficiency, you know, et cetera. They, they tend to match up again and again, and we need people to cut through. Hey, Amanda. Thanks, Alan. Yes, I could, um, Sort of, I guess, building on that as well, if we think about the types of leaders that we've historically looked to, and they're leaders that have perhaps been appointed, or you know, they're our politicians, or they're our mayors, or they're people that we think of have leadership positions, but increasingly, what we know and understand is that, um, that leaders emerge from many different places, and they're not necessarily the ones that we anoint with power. And so there is a really important message in this handbook, which is around how do you enable and support the emerging leaders that are new leaders that have different views that perhaps don't come from the positions of historical power that we've thought about from a leadership perspective. And so there's something in that in how we as leaders ourselves um, play a role in enabling that as well. Thanks, Romana. Um, I'm going to go to the last question and you'll each have a turn with this, but it's, it's sort of uh, referencing the fact that many people on the call are coming to this issue from their own specialty area, be it you know, disability, community engagement, working with homeless people, those kinds of things. So what is your advice on how you can bring a systemic lens to this problem? Uh, if you're coming at it from, if you like, you know, your area of work or your area of focus, how can you bring a systemic lens to that? And what advice would you give to people? And I'll go to you first, Jill. So what immediately sprung to my mind was, um, uh, and also seeing some of the chats pop up about the incredible amount of information out there. One of the things that, it, from personal experience as well, don't be overwhelmed by the complexity and the uncertainty of the, the world that we live in at the moment. Um, to, and that's why we went to, again, just creating this sense of what are the key important things I need to know, what's the mindset I need to adopt, and how can I apply that into my mm -hmm. setting? Um, it is such an enormous challenge to be able to do that for everyone. But recognising that we are all part of the system, that we all have a role to play and that we do also um, have a sense of responsibility that we need to be able to bring to the table. I think starting by actually thinking about, well, what is system thinking? Uh, what are systemic risks? How do I apply them in my context? Um, a lot of people have already done that, but we are engaging beyond the emergency management world now into a world where people have not necessarily been exposed to this complexity. Mm -hmm. So um, being able to help others, and uh, Romana rightly pointed out one of the key principles in there is about nurturing emergent leadership. Mm -hmm. 
And in doing that, it is about actually you know, putting them under your wing, helping them become a bit more disaster literate. When we're talking about some of these complex things, it can be so overwhelming. How do you find the right language to use so you can engage people on these topics? Don't be overwhelmed by it. Um, I know that in my experience, we've gone through all sorts of dips in feeling overwhelmed, but when you come together and when you start to problem solve together and you look at it through all the interconnected nature of all our systems, things emerge. We know we can start to pinpoint where the actual vulnerabilities are, where the pain points are, as Beck so beautifully eloquated just before. Um, so, you know, really the examples are there. Use them, listen to what people are saying and their experiences, and um, hopefully that will help you be able to apply some of this thinking in your context. Thanks, Jill. And before I go to our other speakers, just a reminder, those case study videos are now online. Uh, with, I uh, think, eight leaders across, you know, various sectors that can also help you. So, Beck, would you like to have a go at that question as well? Yeah, I'm going to give a really pragmatic answer because I'm one of these people trying to do it. So um, in terms of uh, my advice to anyone trying to take this approach is get a sheet of paper and map the system as you understand it. Test it with everybody around you in your sector, but also the sectors that you're aligned to and the people who are impacted by what you do and try and understand it from different perspectives and try and build your map out to understand how the system works. There's no substitute for actually working it out. But the other thing is look and cheat. Like there'll be someone else in your sector who's doing this stuff already. Someone might've already worked it out. And my experience is there's there good people doing this work in pretty much every part of every sector across Australia. You just got to find them and band together, get going. Thanks, Beck. And Alan? Well, maybe it's sort of been said in a way, I think get out and talk to people. Or is that just that I've been in lockdown for a very long time in <laughs> Melbourne? But it makes so much difference. Just try and understand others, what's going on for them. Ask heaps of questions. Join things. Be part of it. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. And over to you, Romana. Yeah, my one would be challenge our biases. So I think um, to understand a system, you've actually got to step out of the view you've had of the world before. And so challenge your biases, try to actually think differently and come at um, problems in a different way or from a different angle to help you have a broader, more systemic view. Thanks, Romana. And thank you to all our speakers today, to Jill, to Beck, to Alan and Romana. You brought the handbook alive for our, our listeners and I hope that people will download it and read it and um, gain some, you know, really key insights and watch the case studies. And they've also been... Uh, documented in written form as well that you can download in a companion guide. Uh, so thank you again. Ada is proud to be bringing you our final webinar in the Exploring the 10 Years Beyond Bushfires Report, Supporting Recovery for Children, Families and Schools on Wednesday the 20th of October at 2pm, presented by Professor Lisa Gibbs, Jane Nursey and Bronwyn Sparks and hosted by Andrew Coughlin from the Red Cross. The link will be in the chat if you are interested in registering. On behalf of Ada, thank you for joining us today. We will send you an email once the recording from today's session is live on the Knowledge Hub. When you exit today's Zoom session, you will be asked to complete a short survey. It's been a pleasure to host you this afternoon. Until next time, stay safe and farewell. Thank you.